Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the president and CEO of the Greater Houston Partnership, Bob Harvey. I'm Bob Harvey. I'm the president and CEO of the Greater Houston Partnership, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to the partnership's uh, annual Houston Region Economic Outlook. Uh, you know, earlier this morning, we gained insight from a, a cross-industry panel of experts, both talking about the current Houston economy, but also obviously prognosticating a bit, thinking about the future of Houston, some of the opportunities and threats uh, that we face. I do want to thank again the members of the panel, uh, I think some of whom, if not all of whom, are here. Our moderator was Eddie Robinson, the morning news anchor at Houston Public Media. Did Eddie, I don't know, did he come across? He may have rushed back to the, to the station. Uh, Eddie did a great job. Brad Friels, chairman of Midway Companies. Brad, thank you for being on the panel. Uh, Natalie Marks, I didn't I don't know if Natalie came over. Natalie, as you all know, is managing director and Houston region manager for J.P. Morgan Chase. And David Millich, uh, CEO of United Healthcare's operations in Texas and Oklahoma. David, did you come across? So I don't see them here. Uh, but we really appreciate the panelists, and uh, I think everyone in the meeting this morning got a lot out of that, so thank you. Now we take uh, a little bit of time each December to, to come together, uh, just like we are today, to take a closer look at some of the major industries that, that drive the Houston economy and what are some of the forces that will either propel or perhaps uh, derail uh, these industries in the coming months. And we leverage uh, the partnership's award-winning research team led by Patrick Jankowski uh, and all that activity and discussion. And I believe our research team is viewed as truly an authority on the Houston economy. And hopefully you all see it as a go-to resource for any questions you might have about the Houston economy. And I'll stop for a minute because many of you do call and it might be a situation where you've got an out-of-town visitor and you're looking for some information or a fact. You might have a board meeting in Houston that often meets elsewhere. And again, you want to present an overview on the Houston economy. Those are all things we can respond to. Patrick won't appreciate when I say we can respond overnight, Patrick, but you, you'd probably rather have more than 24 hours notice. Uh, but we're happy to do that. And uh, we want to get the message out about Houston's economy and get it right uh, factually. So we'll, we'll be hearing about uh, from Patrick in just a few minutes after lunch, and we'll be getting his job forecast for 2020. Uh, I do want to take a moment at this point, though, and step back and talk a little bit about the year we've just had. Uh, we at the partnership consider 2019 to have been a very successful year. Uh, it was a year that kicked off with the state legislative session, the 86th legislative session. And I haven't had the chance to say this before in my seven years as CEO of the partnership. I think we actually had a good legislative session this year. Uh, and uh, if you've been a follower of the legislature, you might, you might hopefully agree with that assessment. Uh, our two top priorities going into the legislative session were public education finance reform, which developed into House Bill 3, which was the first real attempt to rethink public ed finance in Texas since the early 90s, and we think it was a very successful effort. Doesn't solve all of our public ed issues by any stretch, but it moves us in a positive direction. And then our second major priority was funding for disaster recovery and resiliency uh, funding for the years ahead. Flood mitigation and how we address that. It's not simply a state issue by any stretch. We need local, state, and federal support for such an effort. But it was important that the state pitch into the effort. Frankly, they were the last, uh, last to get on board in terms of committing real dollars to the effort. So we were pleased. All that legislation passed, all that was signed by Governor Abbott, and now we're focused on kind of how do we implement that. More recently, since the legislative session, our Transportation Advisory Committee worked very closely with Metro in the development of the Metro Next strategy, which was then presented to the public as a bond referendum uh, just a few months ago. And we were very pleased that we were able to work closely with Metro uh, I think create a metro transit plan that we can all be proud of as a, as a community, moves us forward as a community. Uh, the bond issue, uh, uh, while the bond issue was for three and a half billion, substantial in its own right, to fund our transit activity through 2040, it allows us to draw an equal amount of money, federal money, plus some other local money. It's really a seven and a half billion dollar plan 
to move transit forward in the metro service area, most of Harris County. So again, we don't solve every problem anytime we attempt to address an issue, but this moves us further along than we've been. We're very excited about it. You'll hear a lot about bus rapid transit. Of course, you hear about BRT in the context of Post Oak today, but BRT is the element of this new plan, the more cost-effective uh, option for cities like Houston, and you'll see a lot of that in the coming uh, days, weeks, and months. We've also been very involved now for quite a while on Houston's startup ecosystem. I always hate to start discussions about the startup ecosystem by referencing the Amazon loss, but frankly, there was no single event that I think had as dramatic effect on the thinking of Houstonians about what we're doing in this innovation space as not making it to the finalist list in that well-publicized Amazon headquarters HQ2 effort. And though we were doing many things already to reshape our innovation and startup ecosystem in Houston, that was a real spur, a catalyst, and we've seen a lot happen since then as a result. Probably most notable is Rice University's effort to create the ION, which is taking that old Sears building in Midtown, and it's, it's more than just rehabbing it. It's really, it's recreating it into a state-of-the-art innovation hub for Houston and the likes of which you've already seen develop in other cities around the country and around the world. We didn't have anything like it. And that's already improved our discussions. Uh, Mass Challenge, which is a well-known startup development organization, is coming to Houston. Plug and Play, probably the biggest player in Silicon Valley as a startup incubator, is coming to Houston, a number of others. So that's all happening kind of in this urban core. At the same time, things like the Canon, uh, are happening out on the west side. You know, not, not all of innovation is going to occur in the urban core. Some of it will. I will say a lot of it will, but not all of it will. So we're also pleased to see the innovation efforts. And if you haven't had a chance to look at the Canon, uh, just, just west, west of the Beltway, just north of I-10, it's another very exciting innovation hub that's developing in Houston. And there are others I won't get into. Houston Exponential, uh, which was just formed about 18 months ago to be our new champion for the startup ecosystem is gaining traction. And, and as an example of that, they formed the HX Venture Fund and have already raised $35 million to form a fund of funds, which is going to be used to attract the big national VC firms to spend more time in Houston. That's the, that's the punchline of the HX Venture Fund. And we're pleased that a number of Houston companies have stepped up and invested in the fund. The, the, beyond just startups, and what we're doing in the startup ecosystem, that gets you into a discussion more broadly of the digital tech ecosystem of Houston. I'll start with bad news. CBRE ranks Houston as the 34th most developed tech, digital tech hub in the United States. 34th digital tech hub in the United States. That's, that's awful, that's terrible. We're the fourth largest city fifth largest metro. Now some of that is our digital tech strength is hidden because it sits in non-digital tech companies. It's harder to find. It's not necessarily sitting in a Microsoft. I mean, it's not as easy to find. So we've been trying to attract the big digital tech players to, to have a more visible presence in Houston. It was literally true two years ago that Microsoft, AWS, Salesforce, Google Cloud, at least those four did not have their names on a building in Houston. Now that's a simple notion, but it's an important notion that none of them had developed a presence in Houston of a scale and magnitude that suggested a name on a building. So we set out to try to reverse that, and many of you know, I mean, just one example, AWS announced, uh, I guess David, I think, uh, Brad, I think with you, uh, that AWS, are they in your space, city center? Didn't mean to give you a plug, but you know, it's a chance to do that. Uh, 25,000 square feet or so. Uh, but that's you know, the significance of AWS. Instead of serving Houston companies from the West Coast, or dare I say Austin, they're now realizing they can, they can and should and must put their tech workforce in Houston. So we're saying, and beyond that, Bill.com, not as much a household name, Bill.com, a major player in electronic transfer, uh, payment transfer. Uh, decided to have their first office outside of Silicon Valley here in Houston. And that's the kind of wins we need in this digital tech space, and so there's a lot more happening. So I'm excited about that. I, again, I'm really feeling like we're ending the year with some momentum. Uh, I do want to acknowledge probably the big question mark, which our speakers will address, and I won't attempt to, is what's happening in energy. 
uh, both in the short term, you know, the short term is all about 2020 capital budgets, what's the price of oil gonna be, you know, blah, 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 we'll, we'll talk about that. But of course, I'm frankly, I spend more time worried about the big energy question, which we call the energy transition issue, which is the world is changing with respect to its support for and appetite for petroleum. And how do we take the energy capital of the world and position it well in a world where, to some, energy has become a dirty word? We don't think it's a dirty word. We think energy is vital to the global economy. It's vital to people's standards of living. But we do appreciate the fact that the carbon issue is real. It's not going to go away. And how does Houston position itself as a leader in solving the carbon issue, even as we provide low-cost energy? And that's, that's not... That's not easy, but I think that's the role of, of Houston is to help solve that problem. So we're spending a lot of time on that. So as we think about 2020, we think we're approaching it in a, in a, with a, a positive uh, feeling, a positive uh, momentum, and we'll delve into this in a bit. I, I think as you understand what we'll do, Patrick Jankowski uh, will delve into this from a local perspective, kind of across all major segments, but a local perspective. And then Helen Curie, Helen, thank you for being here. Helen is the chief economist of ConocoPhillips, and I'll give her a more complete introduction in a minute. And she'll take it kind of more to a national global economy, but also with a, a clear focus on oil and gas and energy. So uh, thank you for, for Helen, thank you for doing that. So let me, let me acknowledge our sponsors real quick. And here we are at the end of the year, and I do want to say once, one more time that we couldn't do any of the things we do at the partnership, the events we put on without the sponsors who come forward to help make these events possible. Our gold sponsors today are Chevron Corporation and HCA Houston Healthcare. Our bronze sponsors are Centerpoint Energy, ConocoPhillips, First Financial Bank, Lone Star College, Texas Mutual Insurance Company. Our employment forecast underwriter is Transwestern. Our notepad underwriter is Mitsubishi Corporation. And our social media underwriter is Haynes and Boone. Can we have a round of applause for all of the underwriters? This is also a chance where I can acknowledge the members of the board of the Greater Houston Partnership who've served faithfully and in a quite active way. Our board is a, is a very engaged board. It's a large board, but they're very engaged. So with the members of the board of the Greater Houston Partnership that are present today, would you mind standing and let us recognize you? Thank you. Natalie. Thank you, George. The pay's pretty good, right, Kevin? Uh, what was that? What kind of a laugh was that? Uh, no, thank you all. So let's take a minute now. Let's enjoy our lunch. Uh, we'll come back in a minute, and we'll just start the program shortly. So please enjoy your lunch. See you in a minute. Thank you. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Patrick Jankowski. Uh, most of you know Patrick is the partnership's senior vice president of research and our regional economist. And he'll present the organization's Houston employment forecast for 2020. His observations and analysis on economic trends in Houston have appeared in literally hundreds of newspaper, magazine, radio, and TV interviews. He's worked for the Greater, Ship, Greater Houston Partnership and its predecessor, the Greater Houston Chamber of Commerce, for more than 36 years. Uh, <laughs> that's not bad. That's not bad. So be careful if you ask Patrick to put a, a statistic in a historical perspective, because you may be there a while, but that, that's for him. So it's wonderful to have him. So let's, let's move on. Let me have Patrick join me on the stage. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the nice introduction, Bob. I uh, want to let you know, you've got two publications. One publication you received in the morning session, that's the one that you see on your right, Houston Economic Highlights. An actual copy of the forecast will be handed to you as you go outside the door. I uh, want to ask you to take these and review them, because uh, I have to take 12 months of research and condense it into a 25-minute presentation. So you'll get a lot more in this publication. Also, uh, employment forecasts, I, I definitely want to thank Kevin Roberts and Trends Western for underwriting the publication of the forecast. Uh, if it wasn't for you, Kevin, it would be coming out of my budget. So <laughs> thank you very much for that. 
Which brings us to the point, the one on the right does come out of my budget. So if anybody wants to sponsor it next year, see me afterwards, please. <laughs> so let's go ahead and get started. Mark Twain, we probably all remember Mark Twain from uh, our high school or college literature class. Um, probably the most famous American writer that ever lived. What's interesting is that Twain was also a very poor businessman. Uh, Mark Twain went bankrupt at one time and he owed the equivalent of $9 million in today's money. Uh, he could have just walked away, declared bankruptcy, but Twain was a man of great honor and he wanted to pay back all his debts. And so one of the things Twain did is he went on a speaking tour of Europe. He went to Vienna, he went to Paris, he went to London. He was actually in Europe for three years going on the speaking tour, collecting his, his fees, sending them back to the U.S. to pay off his creditors. Twain was actually gone for so long that people in the U.S. thought he was dead. And there was actually, I think it was the New York Herald actually ran a story that said Mark Twain died while in Europe. Well, a reporter came up to Mark Twain after one of his presentations and said, Mr. Twain, do you realize back in the U.S. they're reporting that you're dead? And his reply was, the reports of my death are greatly exaggerated. I'll use this as an introduction to what we're hearing about the U.S. economy and what we're hearing about the global economy. The reports of their demise are greatly exaggerated. And it's real important that we have a strong U.S. economy and a strong global economy because they're going to be what sustains growth in Houston over the next few years as energy goes through another restructuring. So let's get started. Let's talk about the U.S. economy. What do we see in the U.S. economy? Start with the headline, U.S. GDP revised up 2.1% beating the second quarter. Growth enters fourth quarter on a more solid. That's a headline, let me, let me put that on a graph for you. There you go. Two point, no, no, actually what you want to do is you want to see the trend. And you, you can look and you can see that 2.1 is pretty close to what we've seen going back for the last few years. And I would like to see a little bit higher, but 2.1% is pretty decent growth. If you look at if you look at the average over the last 12 months, the U.S. economy has average growth of about 2.1%. If you want to put it in historical perspective, the last five years, 2.2, the last 10, 2.3, the last 20, 2.1, we're pretty much growing at a long-term average rate. Yes, we'd like to see it higher, but if we continue to grow at 2.1% for the next five or 10 years, I'd be pleased with that. Let's talk about jobs. Very important, when someone has a job, they're spending money, if businesses are hiring, that means they think they have enough orders on the books, they have enough business coming in the shop that they need to have people to fill those orders. Uh, headline that we saw for October, for the October drives, U.S. added 128,000 jobs in October despite temporary drag from GM strikes. So there you go. I plotted it for you. You can see. Now let's go ahead and look at it. You can look at it there. You see it, uh, how it goes over the long term. So it's not, there, there are months we've had stronger job growth, months we've had weaker job growth. Now, you look at that, 128,000 in the month of October, not quite as strong as we've seen in the past. But remember, we are 42,000 jobs shy because of the GM strike. You put those 42,000 back, those workers are now back to work, that's 170,000 jobs we created in October. Year to date, 167, you can see the 170,000 jobs that we created in October year-to-date average, a little bit slower than the long-term average, but it's still fairly decent job growth. It's definitely stronger than the 20-year or the 30-year average. So that aspect of the economy is showing growth. Look at consumer spending. U.S. consumer spending increases. Initial reports, it looks like we had a very strong retail season so far for the holidays. You can look at that blue line shows the change from the previous year in spending. As long as that blue line is above that dark black line, that's a sign that consumer spending is growing. It's more than it was this year. And you can see it's still at a fairly healthy pace. Let's look at business investment. This one is a little bit of a concern. Uh, business investment dropped 3% in the third quarter amid trade war uncertainty. But you can look at it here. Once again, that blue line is still well above the black line. We are still seeing growth in business investment. It's a little bit lower than it was this time last year but we're still seeing investment. It's not like that dip that you see, where you can say, how can you have negative investment? Well, this is a calculation of, of, of investment minus depreciation. So even taking into depreciation, in fact, you can see net business investment is up in the US. 
And one of the reasons, though, it's slightly down is we are going through a fracking slowdown. Back up, and you see that little dip that you see from 16 and 17? Energy investment is one of the factors that figures into business investment. And you can definitely see the impact that a slowdown in the oil and gas industry has on business investment in the U.S. And that's probably what we're seeing right now is a little bit of slowdown in overall business investment because it's a slowdown in oil and gas. Okay, so the U.S. economy, hopefully you can see, seems to be doing fairly well, which is important to Houston because it's going to sustain our growth. Let's talk about global growth. Barron's headline just this week, the global economy is bottoming out, and that's good news for stocks. Actually, it's good news for all of us. It's good news, especially for Houston. What you've got right there, that chart, that is the 10 largest economies in the world. The U.S. is still way ahead of China. But those 10 economies account for 69% of all economic activity in the world. What's the outlook look like? If you look there, yeah, the U.S. and China slipping a little bit. But if you go across, Germany is going to be up, the UK is going to be up, France is up, India's up, Italy's up, Brazil's up, South Korea. We're starting to see growth again return to the global economy. Okay, that was the top 10. Let's just go down one more tier. Let's look at economies 11 through 20. Canada, Russia, Spain, and so forth. Another 13.7%. You add the first 10, the second 10, you've got over 80% of all economic activity. And look there, if you can look across the board, Canada, Russia, Australia, Mexico, Indonesia, all these second tier economies are going to be growing next year. The media seems to be slow in picking this up. I mean, but this is what the International Monetary Fund, the biggest lender out there, is seeing. So if you want to look at real global growth, 3.5% is the 10 year average. You want to look at just in general, the global economy should be growing between 3.5, 3.9%. And these are forecasts. On the left is historic, what we expect to happen this year. On the right is what's pro projected for next year. Not quite back up to that 3.5, but you see a slight increase in global trade and global, global growth. And once again, that's important to Houston because for the next few years, we're gonna be very dependent upon what happens in the US economy and the global economy to drive growth in this economy. Uh, but there is that big wild card out there, it's the tariff war, the trade war, that could upset things. I'm not gonna to dwell too much on this because it seems like we hear about this every day. I think the business can be starting to factor in the fact that there's uncertainty out there and we're just gonna to have to find some way to deal with it. Which gets to Houston. How are we doing in Houston overall? Job growth is actually doing fairly well. If you look on the left-hand side, you look on the right-hand side, the right-hand side is growth we've had since we came out of the fracking bust. The left-hand side was the fracking boom. If you look on the right-hand side, yeah, it's not quite as high as job growth on the left-hand side, but what you see in 17 and 18 and 19 is more sustainable growth than you saw early on. Because this growth is growth that's what's taking place with oil prices between 50 and $60 a barrel. The growth that you see on the left, we had to have oil at $100 a barrel or more. So we are seeing growth in the economy. If you want to see sectors that are growing, healthcare continues to grow, administrative support services, it's contracting out for, for operation, back office operations and other things, durable goods manufacturing and so forth. So the economy is growing. But Houston's growth is slowing. We are starting to see a slowdown in Houston. Uh, you can see it here in vehicle sales. You can see a little bit of a, a pickup after the fracking bus, and they're starting to trend back down again. If you look at the purchasing managers index, also the PMI, this is a survey I've done of purchasing managers in the region. They contact them once a month, ask them a series of questions about sales, about production, about employment, about inventories and backlogs. Whenever that red line is above that solid line, that's suggesting that the economy is growing and will, will continue to grow. Whenever that red line drops below that black line, that's a sign that the economy is contracting and will contract. We are still positive, but we're not strongly positive, which is a sign that we have growth, but growth is not as strong as we had seen in previous years. Uh, you can see construction starts. That big bubble in the middle is a pet petrochemical plant boom. You saw kind of the mini boom there, and we're starting to see a slowdown in construction starts as well. And this is uh, sales tax allocations. When people say sales tax, their automatic assumption is consumer purchases. But businesses spend as well, whether it's on office supplies and office equipment or services or construction materials, they spend. Uh, consumer purchases don't dip quite as much as during the business cycle, but the business purchases do. This is the 12 most populous cities in the, in the Houston region. It accounts for about 80% of all sales tax collections. You see this nice gradual rise. 
But what's happened is the rate of increase is slowing, and it's slowing dramatically. Sales tax collections in the region, as a measure of general economic activity, are higher than they were last year, but not as, they're not growing at the same rate as they were growing a year ago. Sales tax collections are only growing at about 2% right now. Which gets me to my next quote from Mark Twain. History doesn't repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme a lot. And I use this because of this right there. We're getting ready to see some rhyming in Houston's history. Uh, you want to see the rhyming? The rhyming is right here in this chart. Uh, we are getting ready to go through another very soft spot, perhaps a downturn in the oil and gas industry. And we kind, of, we kind of forget about that, just how cyclical this economy is, how often we go through downturns. Okay, uh, Bob said I've been to the partnership uh, 30 years. Uh, you know, I began my career studying this economy almost 40 years ago. This is my sixth downturn I will probably witness in the oil and gas industry. If you began your career 30 years ago in Houston, you've seen five downturns. If you began your career 20 years ago, you've seen four downturns. If you began your career 10 years ago, you've seen three downturns. I mean, if you're just now starting your career, welcome to Houston. <laughs> if you stay here before you retire, you'll probably see several more downturns. So it's interesting. Look, look at the headlines. You know, I'm not going to put a bunch of oil and gas charts up. Helen's going to talk more about that. But you can see the oil's worst oil glut is much worse than it looks. The world is facing the longest oil glut in at least three decades. Uh, global oil glut is squeezing the U.S. shell industry as oil prices drop and money dries up. Is the shell boom going bust? Stock prices sink in a rising ocean of oil. Oil sector cutting spending as Wall Street turns its back. Texas energy dips and oil layoffs. It's interesting, okay, I said history rhymes a lot. The top headline is from September 2019. The bottom headline is from June 2015. Top headline there, January 2016. The bottom headline is from November 2019. The top headline, January 2016. Bottom deadline, bottom headline, July 2019. Seems like we're rhyming a lot, doesn't it? And let's go to that one, last one. February 2015 on the top, October 2019 on the bottom. So yeah, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme a lot, and we are getting ready to see some rhyming. I mean, uh, this is not a sonnet, guys. This is an epic saga. And this is just something the way Houston is. To give you some idea just how long it goes back, this is a cover from the magazine the Chamber of Commerce, her predecessor, used to publish. It says, whatever happened to $100 oil? Maybe you can't see it back there. This cover is dated April of 1985. We were asking the same question almost 35 years ago. But once again, if you're someone who's had their career in Houston, you're used to this is part of the cycle. What's interesting is that some of the things I see now, since I've been studying this economy for over 35 years, what we see coming out of the teens, 2018-19, looks very similar to what we saw coming out in 88 and 89 and entering the 90s. Now, we had a period where oil and gas industry collapsed in the 80s and then gradually recovered. We're in a period right now where we're seeing oil and gas struggling and real estate not being quite as healthy. We're not gonna, it's, this is, please understand, this is not gonna be a repeat of the 80s, but what I'm saying is what we're seeing looks a lot like what it looked like after that. You can look here, uh, probably some of the easiest data to get, the best data to get is what we see happening in real estate. In the 80s, we built 70, almost 72 million square feet of office space. At the height, it was 30% of it was vacant. It took us almost 10 years to nearly cut that vacancy rate in half. Here we are now, 33 million square feet of office space that we built in this last go around. Availability rate is 23.6%. How long will it take for us to get that back down to the teens? Now, if you wanna look at it, it probably will take a while because this is off of absorption going back to 2015. We've had some absorption, some negative absorption. You add all that together, and since 2015, office absorption has actually been a negative one million square feet. If you're a real estate owner, it's a challenge. If you're someone who needs to lease space, it's a great opportunity. Uh, Rhymes with multifamily, we built 100,000 units, apartment units, in the 80s. 
And after we realized we overbuilt, over the next six years, we built fewer than 10,000 because it took a while for us to absorb all that. Here we are, we just built 75,000 units. We've got another 21,000 under construction, another 28,000 proposed. If we build everything, we're gonna end up in a period of about 10 years with another 100,000, 125,000 units. If you simply take the under construction proposed, that's 50,000 units approximately. To absorb that, we're gonna need to create 300,000 jobs. It's gonna take a while to do that, guys. And let's talk about warehouse and industrial space. We added 48 million square feet in the 80s. The vacancy rate only got up to 15.8, but it took a while for us to get it even down by four percentage points. Here we are now, 86 million square feet in class A vacancy. The stuff that's been built since 2015 is up to 15%. Now here we are, 21 million square feet under construction, only a fifth of it pre-leased. Typical year we absorb six to eight million square feet. We could be facing a glut of industrial space. Once again, it's a Challenge if you own the property, but it's a great opportunity if you're looking for industrial, industrial warehouse space. So I, I put the slide in here because I really want to emphasize this. We are not going down the path of the 80s. We're going on a different path. But some of the things we look at look very similar to how we came out of the 80s and we had some challenges. Coming out of this downturn, we have some challenges. But we're going to take the high path. Uh, we will grow even with the low oil prices. This right here, what you're seeing is, is the top line is job growth in the 90s. The bottom line is oil prices in the 90s. You didn't see oil prices hardly ever get above $20 a barrel, yet we still managed to add jobs. But we did not add them in energy. Most of the job growth came from somewhere else. It's probably what we're going to see going forward. It doesn't mean we're not going to be adding any jobs in energy, but we're not going to see the lift in this economy that we saw from energy earlier in the decade. The growth is gonna to have to come from other places like the global economy or ties to the global economy and ties to the US economy. One of the reasons why we did well in the 90s, as you can see, the US did well. And a little red bar to the left-hand side, yes, that was a downturn. That's a downturn associated with the spike in oil prices that occurred after Iraq invaded Kuwait. Otherwise, it was pretty strong growth throughout. If you were to look at Shipments, our, our ties of the global economy got stronger in the 90s as they need to be getting stronger in, in the next decade. And you can see we almost doubled in number, the, the tonnage through the port and pretty much doubled the, the, the value of trade going through the port. And then we have this guy here. Anybody recognize what that is? A few of you. I had one of those at one time. This is, for those of you who know, that's a compact computer. That was, that was their big claim to fame, their first portable computer. Actually, it's more like luggage. It's like carrying a suitcase around. And it's interesting. If you look on the right-hand side, you see those two little uh, five and a quarter inch floppy disks. And you take that floppy disk out, you'd walk over to the next office and go, here are the files you asked for. Now, I put this up here because one of the things that helped Houston out an awful lot in the 90s is innovation in this sense. At one time, Compaq employed 17,000 people in Houston. 17,000. They went from nothing to being one of the fastest firms to get on the Fortune 500. If you think about it, 17,000, they were the largest private sector employer at one time. And they accounted for, I tried to do the math last night, the data's a little funny, but it looked like they accounted for one in every 14 manufacturing jobs in this region. And so once again, that theme of how this looks at, one of the things we need to do, and Bob talked about it, is we're gonna be looking more towards innovation in the 90s to help drive job growth. So what can we expect next year? Job losses, no. Weaker home sales, no. It seems like people still want that American dream. But we are gonna see slower income growth. We are gonna see weaker auto sales. We'll see more consolidations in the energy industry. There are gonna be challenges for commercial real estate challenges for retail, and maybe some stronger population growth. One of the things which draws people to Houston is the job market. And if we have a job, weak job market, we're not gonna be drawing as many people here. But I know it's unscientific. I am seeing more out-of-state license plates on the freeways than I saw just a year ago. So hopefully we're gonna see some more population growth. And population growth itself will help support the economy. So what is the jobs forecast? What is the partnership forecasting for 2020? 42,300 jobs next year. 
That's what the forecast is. This number is in, in the document that you'll get when you leave. If you want to see how that fits in, you can see job growth going back to 2000. Uh, 42.3 is what our forecast is. Right now, we're on a 12 basis, 64.4 for the last 12 months, but that number is going to be revised. So it's not as strong as we would like to see, but there's still growth. You know, it'll look more like 2004 or maybe 2010, but it's not going to look like 11 or 14. Where is the job growth going to take place? Healthcare, population growth as people age. As, and I hate to say this, as we have more chronic diseases, there are going to be more people needing treatment. Most of the government employment is going to be in, in public school districts, community colleges, universities, hotels, restaurants, and bars. I like to joke that we do like to eat and drink in this town. Should be enough activity for construction to carry us through uh, next year, but I'm a little concerned after that. But you can see that, and we're going to see growth in those sectors, but we are expecting to see continued losses in information. That's media, that's telecommunications. Retail is still going to struggle with fighting with all the online purchases and forecasting a loss of probably about 4,000 jobs in the broad energy sector next year. I suspect we're going to have losses reported this year, just Texas Workforce Commission is slow to report those losses. If we lost 4,000 jobs in energy next year, that would be a loss of about 5% of the energy jobs. And if you consider it, we probably lost some this year. We might be looking at a loss between 5 and 10% in this current go-around in the energy industry. So once again, going, going back to 89, you know, how we were coming out of 89, entering the 90s, and looking at that compared to 19. Because like I said, we're not having a repeat of the 80s, but as we enter the next decade, it's going to look an awful lot like the what Houston dealt with in the 90s. And I was kind of thinking how things have changed since then. Uh, you know, in 89, George Bush was our president, now it's Donald Trump. Uh, can you remember the uh, Walkmans that we had with the little earbuds that you'd walk around while jogging? Now we have earbuds. Uh, 30 years ago, we were talking about tearing down the Berlin Wall. Now we're talking about putting up a wall. Uh, 30 years ago, Seinfeld, this great show about all these friends in New York was a hit. And now it's Game of Thrones where all everybody wants to do is kill each other. <laughs> so you, you might look at that and you might be just a little pessimistic. <laughs> or you might figure, well, you know, I've got two ways to look at this. I can be Eeyore and I can go, oh, woe is me. Things aren't any good. Things look bad. It always rains on me. Or you can be the optimist and say, okay, yeah, there's some challenges out there, but I'm going to see the glass half full. And that's really what we need to do, because if you look at the 90s, even though we did not have much help from the energy industry, we still added 900,000 residents, 500,000 jobs, 81 billion in wages, and GDP added another 100 million. It won't be growing the way we grew with oil prices high, but we'll still grow and hopefully we'll get some help from energy. So, which at least my last Mark Twain quote, better to be an optimist and wrong half the time than a pessimist and right all the time. <laughs> and so I say that because in Houston, history has always been on the side of the optimist, and that is the safe bet. So with that, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. All right. Well, that was fun, as always, Patrick. Thank you so much. Uh, so now that we have the Houston perspective, it's time to take a look at the national and global economy to even a greater extent than Patrick did. And so, as I mentioned earlier, to lead that part of our meeting, I want to introduce Helen Curie, Chief Economist with ConocoPhillips. Let me tell you a little bit about Helen. She manages the strategic planning initiatives, oversees the long-range plan development, advises on investment analysis and political risk. She does a lot of things at ConocoPhillips. With over 25 years of experience in business, government, and academia, she brings valuable perspectives to corporate planning and strategy. Her prior leadership roles in energy include business development, M&A strategy, upstream and downstream business analysis, commercial risk, and market analysis. Before joining the energy industry, she held roles in academia as a finance professor at Elan University and LaGrange College in Georgia, and in government as an economic analyst. Helen has published work in finance and management journals and energy industry publications. She's a frequent speaker at industry venues 
and a guest university lecturer. She's a member of the Mississippi State University Foundation Board of Directors. That gives you a little hint as to where she's from. And uh, also the College of Business Executive Advisory Board at Mississippi State. She's also on the UT Energy Institute Executive Advisory Board, and she was named as one of oil and gas investors' top 25 influential women in energy in 2018. So please help me welcome Helen to the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. Pardon me, I'm old enough I have to put these on now. Uh, I'll start with just a comment of ConocoPhillips is extremely grateful for the opportunity to, to uh, spend some time with you today and share some, uh, some of our thoughts on uh, the, the markets and, and the economy. Uh, I, I would also point out, I think we're all in the room very, very blessed to have such fine staff that we do at, at the partnership to put on this event every year and all the things that they do throughout the year that are active, not only in energy, which is where I tend to interact with them a lot, of course, uh, but all the industries represented across the room, we have, I think we all know, we have an outstanding group of people working alongside us at, at our partnership. So thank you all. So given, now that Patrick has given me a lot of, of fodder, so to speak, of uh, either, the, are, are we pessimists or optimists? I was sitting there thinking, well, I actually, I have to be a pragmatist. So that lets me be both, I guess, uh, depending on, uh, just depending on the, the year or the week and the, and the issues in front of us. Uh, so I'll dive into the slides here a little bit. That's the message from our lawyers you can read. <laughs> and just to, to, to bring you up to date on who ConocoPhillips is, is today, because we have an interesting past as a company. Uh, today we are one of the world's largest independent exploration and production companies. We're a pure upstream company. Uh, we are active in 17 countries worldwide. We do have a global footprint and global set of businesses to keep us busy. Um, we have production running at around 1.3 million barrels of oil equivalent per day. And as we have stated publicly, we intend to maintain that level of production with very moderate growth over the coming years uh, as cash, flow, uh, cash flows and distribution plans allow. The last point I'll hit on here is, is our headcount. We have about 10,400 employees worldwide. Uh, roughly 3,000 of those are here in Texas, and a few over 2,200 are here in Houston, including some here today. In terms of our activity level, our footprint in, in the U.S. And, and Canada, we're very proud to, to be able to say that we are in all of the major uh, unconventional oil plays, as noted here on, on the slide, uh, from Eagleford and Permian, both here in Texas. Uh, now Brera and Bakken and in the Montney up in, up in Canada. And we've done a lot, a lot of work over the last few years to be able to make one of the other statements on this page, and that is that about 50% of our resources in what we call the big three um, unconventional plays in, in U.S. and Canada, or U.S. rather, uh, we have a cost of supply less than $40 a barrel on a WTI basis. Uh, and that's taken a lot of hard, hard work, but that allows us to be very uh, resilient as, as a company to oil price cycles because I would agree with what Patrick has noted. The oil and gas industry is cyclical. Most commodities are, and that is not going to change. So in terms of how we run our business and how many other companies in the room uh, tend to run their businesses is to plan through the cycles, make your, try to build a business that is resilient to the downside and gives you a lot of flexibility and, and the upside on those, on those price cycles. So in terms of uh, the thoughts I wanted to leave you with today, this is a bit of a discussion roadmap, but there, there are really five key points that I do want, want you to be able to take away today from, from the remarks I make. And one is that I, I would characterize the global economy as being relatively healthy. That would be consistent with what Patrick was saying. Uh, we are definitely in a slow growth mode. You often hear uh, remarks of, about, we'll just keep grinding higher, and that's probably true. Uh, we may have a year or two where you see exceptional rates of economic growth, followed by likely a year or two of much slower rates of growth. But we're, we are tending to trend higher because, in general, the global economy is relatively, relatively healthy. 
In terms of oil and gas markets, you will continue to see those to be very well supplied, and I have much more to say about that. Also, you will see U.S. production continue to grow, both for oil and natural gas, for the next few years. Not forever, but for at least the foreseeable future. Along with that, you should expect to see U.S. oil and gas exports increase. Trade is a very important part, always has a very, been a very important part of the, of the oil and gas business. But I think for the, the U.S. and Texas economy, thinking about trade becomes more and more important in today's environment and in the coming years. And then lastly, um, we, always, we always include a comment about uh, government policies, and that's certainly important in uh, this year and next year as elections are taking place. It's very important to the economy here in Houston and the state of Texas and in the, and, and, and the whole country that we continue to have policies that are supportive of our activities. And that's good not just for the energy industry itself, but for other industries because our supply chains reach many states where you don't see oil and gas occur, but there's likely to be a valve or a flange made in some state and trucked across the United States, and that we create a lot of jobs by virtue of what we do. So with that, let me go into a few words about the economy at a global level. So as, as, uh, I'm not going to repeat everything that, that Patrick had hit on. We, we've definitely seen uh, some downward revisions in expectations uh, and underperformance in 2019. Now that's not all bad because we are still growing. Uh, 2019's been a, a bit of a, a, a letdown perhaps uh, if you look at manufacturing orders and new export orders both uh, there on the top graph. Global business confidence reflects this reality. We've seen confidence tend to slide. Uh, but that should start to cycle back up next year. And then finally, uh, the IMF has uh, had several downward revisions in its forecast for 2019 during 2019. So it's all about expectations. We came into the year expecting a uh, global growth of about 3.6 uh, or 3.7 percent based on IMF's numbers. Uh, and what we've seen, not only by the IMF, but virtually every other economic forecasting agency, is, is a set of downward revisions over the course of the year. We're currently setting at a, um, a global growth number this year for of about 3.1%. Uh, but directionally, we are expecting that to get better. So maybe that's the optimist in the room. Uh, you, you do see government policies responding to, to all of this reality that uh, I'm showing you and that Patrick showed you. You see a lot of stimulus policies around, around the world, whether it be in China with, with various uh, changes in policies around capital, capital controls and, and, and lending and in financial institutions and the financial sector there. Uh, European economies, ECB, all, all in stimulus mode. And then, of course, here in the States, we've seen our own Federal Reserve shift course this year and go from tightening to, to easing again to, to try to stimulate things. So with that as a backdrop, we tend to think that 2020 will be a better year economically than, than we've seen in 2019. But keep in mind, 2019 has actually been pretty good. So in, in the energy sector, we actually care about economic activity a lot because that, that informs our views on global demand, both for oil and natural gas. This is a quick snapshot of how, uh, how we current, at ConocoPhillips, how we currently see the global oil market uh, balance uh, in uh, 2019 and 20, and you have a couple of years there of background. For 2019, we, following the economic, uh, the slower economic growth, we've revised down our views on uh, global oil demand growth. We currently have oil demand growing in 2019 at about 800,000 barrels a day. Uh, that's compared to going into the year with uh, most estimates of oil demand growing this year at between 1.2 and 1.6 million barrels a day, so 800,000 is half or 75% of those, of those two numbers. So we're at a much lower level of, of demand growth for oil this year than had been expected. Uh, next year's demand growth is expected to be somewhere in the range of 1.2 or 1.1 rather to 1.5 or 6, depending on the, the analysts you read. Uh, so the, the forward look is, is in a positive direction. What's helping to keep the markets balanced, and you see uh, a big inventory draw, so the gray bar there for 2019 is, is a big negative number, about 550,000 barrels a day of inventory draws in 2019. So we have demand growing, 
but we've, we have more cutbacks in supply that are helping to uh, lead into that, that inventory draw, and that's, you've, you've seen that uh, come about from OPEC cuts. Of course, OPEC is meeting today, and OPEC plus, meaning Russia and the other um, <clears throat> ancillary parties, parties will be joining the OPEC ministers tomorrow. Uh, the OPEC cuts have made a lot of contributions to this drawdown in inventories. Some of those cuts are voluntary, as you know, many, some other cuts are, are, we would classify as supply disruption. So if you think of the sanctions in Iran and the, and the cutback and the availability of Iranian barrels on the market, uh, we've seen some significant declines in Venezuela uh, due to the political turmoil that uh, the country of Venezuela is in. And there are a host of other little things that start to add up that have restrained supply growth in, in 2019. And all of that comes in spite of countries like the U.S. continuing to grow, to grow production. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk more about the U.S. in just a moment. So for 2020, we also expect um, supply to grow uh, and to help to balance with demand. We see 2020's market uh, largely balanced, as you can see here. In, in this, this particular set of numbers, we have uh, about 100,000 barrel a day build in inventories in 2020. That's... Uh, yeah, loosely speaking, that's that's not huge. Um, we'll see how we'll see what comes out of the OPEC meetings today and tomorrow. That will that could swing these numbers substantially and could swing market sentiments substantially, depending on what they come out with. For natural gas, uh, it's another growth story. So this is global global natural gas demand. There are the, the bars in the graph, and then the red line is is the LNG uh, gas on the water percentage of that global market. So LNG is growing as a percent of the global market, no surprise to this audience. The good news with, with gas is, is that similar to oil, we are seeing that as a growth commodity. You see a lot of growth in the, the non-OECD countries, the developing markets, uh, where gas is being used for power and for cooking and a lot of other, a lot of other uses where gas is a very clean and affordable source, source of energy. This year's growth, 2019's growth in demand for natural gas has been a little bit disappointing. Uh, it's been about, on a percentage basis, about one, one and a half percent a year uh, growth, and that compares with the last few years. The global, global gas market has probably grown at closer to four percent. Uh, some of this is temporary, so as, as noted on the slide, coming into 2019, we've had some inventory overhangs, particularly in Europe and Russia, because last winter was uh, not not um, as cold as, as, as would be normal, so there was a bit of excess inventory on the market. That's contributed to some softening in global spot LNG prices in, in 2019. Uh, we could see more of that in 2020. Again, it really depends on uh, weather and uh, win winter weather and economic growth. But in general, as I said, this is a growth story of, of global gas demand growing and U.S. exports continuing to play a role in that. So let me move now to uh, a little bit about the U.S. And I'll preface this with just reminding you that what we've done in the U.S. is, is truly stunning. If you look back over the last decade or two, which I'll show in a moment, uh, it is truly remarkable what, what we've done in the United States. And any, any, anyone here born or, or in Texas or who grew up in Texas can be very proud of the fact that all of this started in, in the state of Texas. And Texas still plays a leading role in oil and gas production, particularly in, in the context of the U.S. So for oil, starting here. <clears throat> On the left-hand side is a quick uh, history of, of oil production in the U.S., and we've divided this into tide oil, so that's the oil from uh, the uh, plays such as Eagleford Permian, Anadarko, which would be scoop stack, Niobrara, Bach, and a few other small bits. Um, tide oil and then the rest of the, the oil there is, is conventional, so that's all, all the other onshore, Gulf of Mexico and Alaska. <clears throat> You know, it wasn't too long ago that all the expectations for U.S. oil production were, were that this U.S. US production might, might kind of churn along at five to six million barrels a day, but it would, it would taper off and the U.S. would just be importing more and more oil. Most of you know that story. And we turned that literally on a dime in a historical context. So we're now, we're now at a point where 
Uh, we're, we're exporting oil. I'll talk more about that later. But in, in terms of the unconventionals, tide oil is now over half, 65 percent of, of U.S. production. So truly remarkable. And if you follow EIA's numbers, you know that yesterday EIA's weekly estimates came out with U.S. production at 12.9 million barrels a day. That's huge. We'll end the year probably over 13. We have a few more weeks. Uh, and that, so that compares with, we entered the year at 11.7. We go out over 13, we're looking at over 1.3 million barrels a day of growth. Just crude and condensate, not the NGLs. So just a remarkable story here. Equally impressive is natural gas. And as you know, natural gas actually is the, is the predecessor of what, what the industry started doing in tight oil. We started with shale gas up in the Barnett, just out around Fort Worth, again, based in Texas. Uh, so with shale gas, we're, we're arguably at, at our 20-year birthday, depending on when, how picky you want to be about when Barnett development, fracking, and hy on hy hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling uh, came together in the Barnett. Uh, but if you count that in the late 90s, we're easily at 20 years into, into our experience with shale gas, and still growing. Uh, <clears throat> as a whole, shale gas is now over 70% of, of U.S. production. Uh, on a daily basis for, for production, um, we're probably going to be hitting 100 BCF a day in the next few weeks. Uh, we, we've hit some days of 95 already. Um, <clears throat> that is, those, what, we, what we've done in gas and then oil on the previous page, again, I just can't emphasize enough how remarkable this is for, not just for the ENP industry, but for the U.S. economy. Uh, I'll pause here because Patrick dropped so many Mark Twain co quotes. I was writing one down that I, uh, I remembered reading in the past, so this is a bit of a paraphrase. I like it because it applies, in my opinion, it applies to how, uh, how the, the industry, the energy industry, uh, kind of got itself into trouble. So the, the Mark Twain quote goes something like, it's not the things that you don't know in life that get you into trouble. It's the things that you know for sure, but just aren't so, that cause you problems. And I think about that, and I look back at this and, and the, the prior page, and it, we, we were all in this mindset of, well, we'll just have to import more oil. Well, we'll just build some regas terminals and import gas. Uh, but that just wasn't so. We thought it was, but it wasn't. Thank goodness. So where are we going from here? So here's a collage um, <clears throat> of projections for U.S. crude oil product production on the left and U.S. natural gas production on the right. Just a, couple, just a hodgepodge of industry analysts that, whose numbers we, we use. Um, the simple observation here is these are all up. Uh, <clears throat> the rate of growth will slow. No, no debate there. We do think the rate of growth year on year will start to slow. Some of that is a natural outcome of the fact that shale gas and tide oil wells have a, a steep decline rate in the first couple of years before they tend to plateau. So you, <clears throat> you have a bigger decline rate. As you build production, you have a bigger decline rate that you have to cut, try to overcome year over year. So that inherently kind of creates a drag on your net growth year to year, which is what you see here and what you see in the EIA numbers. But all in all, it's still a positive story of growth. The resource is there. It's cost competitive. We should see growth in both U.S. gas and, uh, and oil. In terms of regionally, where is a lot of that growth coming from for oil? Permian. Permian is the big story. We, we may see years of uh, net growth in, in the Eagleford or the Bakken. Bakken's actually having a year of net growth this year. Eagleford's a little bit more flat. But that'll, that'll just depend, over time, that will depend really on, on uh, drilling decisions by, by producers, the resources there to, to, be, to be able to develop. For natural gas, the Permian comes up again because there's so much associated gas, and that's listed there on the right-hand slide. Haynesville's a very interesting play, of course, not too far from here in northwest Louisiana, spills over a bit into East Texas. Uh, so we should see, given the rig count that's uh, occurred in Haynesville over most of this year, and given where it is now, we should see some net growth in Haynesville gas production uh, in the next few years. And then Appalachia here is the combination of Marcellus and Utica. 
net growth there as well. So what, what's happening here? What, what's going on with the industry is the deployment of a lot of technology and innovation. So going back, to, I'll, I'll call out a comment Bob made about uh, the Houston not being known as, as a tech center, and that, that is unfortunate, because a lot of that tech is buried within the oil and gas companies. We don't do this without a heck of a lot of technology. A lot of computers, a lot of seismic imaging, all kinds of scientists, data analysts are the new term. Uh, we use a lot of data analytics, and we do partner with the Amazons and Microsofts and a host of other high-tech companies from Silicon Valley to, to help us do what we do and figure out how to do it better. So that's the backdrop for why, as, as stated on the page here, we, we expect productivity gains to continue, although they may get um, increase at a smaller pace over time, kind of a natural evolution. Companies are tending to focus these days on maximizing e e efficient extraction, more so than quick growth. You've heard the terminology around capital discipline and, and investors want their, their money back, the emphasis on free cash flows, a positive free cash flow. That, will, that, that is shaping the industry's performance this year and will continue to be a factor in the next few years. But as I said already, net-net, we expect growth in production. One last thing on the, that I'll touch on on this slide we're particularly proud of at ConocoPhillips is the work we've done on improving recovery rates. So most people don't realize just how little oil you actually get out of the ground relative to what the geologists say is actually there. So as noted here, the average recovery rate on a tidal oil deposit is, is typically about 5 to 10 percent. So again, you know there's a lot more there. You're only able to efficiently extract 5 or 10 percent of it. We and other companies are working to figure out ways to get more out of the ground, out of that same well. And we have some cases where we pushed our recovery rate in Eagleford to over 20 percent. So those are some of the, the really interesting factors kind of under the hood for what helps U.S. oil and gas production to continue growing uh, year after year. A quick interesting thing on that that's really affects oil more so than gas is, is the quality factor. Um, <clears throat> tight oil is, is a very light quality. So what you're seeing on the left-hand side of the page is, is what we call API gravity, so it's a measure, relative measure of weight or density. And what we've seen as U.S. tide oil has, has grown, we've seen the, um, the weight, the quality of, um, of crude that U.S. refiners put through themselves run, that's tended to trend upward, so it's a lighter and lighter oil. That has implications for refinery net backs and the types of products that they're able to produce. <clears throat> So what that translates into is, is more oil needing to be exported because U.S. refiners have adapted. They've made adjustments to a lot of this lighter quality, but they can't swallow all of it, not efficiently, uh, and still make money and still optimize the way they're running the refineries. So a lot of this tight oil does need to get exported. It is getting exported today. We've seen exports grow. Um, <clears throat> but that will continue to be a, a very... Uh, front of mind kind of issue for us in, in the future. One last thing on, on Permian here, both for oil and gas, is we've had a lot of infrastructure get built. We've had a lot of infrastructure all across the country get built over the last decade. Uh, but here I'm focusing really on, on Permian. And this infrastructure, as you read the slide, <clears throat> you'll see this a lot of this infrastructure is pointed at the Gulf Coast. So. In the case of oil, there's a, there's a lot of new pipeline capacity that's taking oil in, into corpus. That can either go on, on large ships to go overseas, it can get barged up the coast to Houston or over to Louisiana coast for refining, et cetera, et cetera. You also see a lot of, of oil um, pipeline capacity, that's that bright blue up there, coming straight here to Houston. So <clears throat> that, means, that means that those barrels need to get get onto a ship or get processed here in Houston. So that's, that's bringing economic activity here. Similar story for gas, not quite as obvious here. Gas, we actually still need, are going to need new, new pipeline capacity out of the Permian as, as that volume, volume grows. Uh, <clears throat> but a lot of that is, is uh, a lot of the pipelines are moving here to, to the Houston and the Gulf Coast area. So I keep mentioning trade, I keep mentioning exports, and that's where I'm going to try to wrap things up here in, in just the next few minutes, <clears throat> is 
Exports are just vitally important to the continuation of the, the success story for U.S. oil and gas. Uh, for oil exports, we're seeing a lot of new capacity being added uh, here in Houston, Corpus Christi, and then lesser amounts uh, in other places along, along the coast. That'll need to continue to grow. For LNG, similar story. There, there are several uh, export uh, liquefaction facilities already online. Uh, sizable handful of other liquefaction facilities in Texas and Louisiana that are in the um, permitting process could get FID'd in the next couple of years. We are expecting some of those to get FID'd in the next few years. So we, so we should see additional LNG exports going out of the Gulf Coast in the not too distant future. Going back to the big picture in terms of how does all this look for, for the US, you can, what I'm showing you here is the flip-flop in, in kind of the energy trade balance. I'm limiting energy here to oil and gas. So to the left-hand side of the page, further back in history, U.S. was a major net, net importer of oil and natural gas. Where we are today, we're on the verge of being a net exporter of both of those. Again, a very, very big deal from, from a business standpoint when you're going from being a net buyer to a net seller of your commodity. And I've got all those jobs and income here at home from, from that production. Um, and the, it's important to comment here, I don't want to forget this, that uh, the production affects all states in the union. Um, even, though, even though you think of just Texas or Oklahoma, you think of a handful of states as being the major oil or gas producing states. There was a fascinating study that the consultancy IHS did back in 2015, which may still be available on their website, uh, where they, they, they actually went through, through the supply chain, and they showed that any oil or gas well uses parts, uses some input from virtually every state in the nation. So even though you may be living in a state like Michigan or Indiana and think that oil and gas production doesn't really do anything for me locally, well, actually it does. If you go back, if you go through and look at the entire supply chain for all the parts, and stuff that goes into oil and gas wells. It comes from a lot of different places. Equally impressive are some jobs numbers that IHS also did in a different study in 2015. So by their estimates, um, for each one job in the ENP sector, that creates an additional three jobs indirectly, and then beyond that, an additional six that are induced in the broader economy. So those are huge jobs multipliers for just one job in, in the EMP sector. So again, energy production is really a big deal for the whole economy. It's not just for the producing states to enjoy. And I had to end with taking this back home to Texas. Uh, Texas, in terms of production, is, if it, if it were its own country, some think it is, is uh, the fourth largest producer, maybe the third if you take the U.S. off there, uh, the third largest energy producer in the world. Pretty darn impressive. Out of U.S. production, 40% of, of U.S. oil comes from Texas, 20% of U.S. natural gas is produced here in Texas. Be very proud of that. What, what the industry also does is generate about $14 billion in state and local taxes and royalties. Pretty, pretty good number there. And over 350,000 high paying jobs. And I will close with these, this, this summary here of uh, <clears throat> the resources there in terms of, of production. Uh, the, the industry is not limited by, by lack of resource for, for the production. There's a lot of resource that's available at globally competitive costs in, in the United States. What's, what's very important that we continue to see are policies that are supportive of production and transportation and exports in order for this whole, whole uh, system to, to keep working. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Let me, let me pick up on one thing she just said um, and related to a policy issue we're going to be talking a lot about next year, and that's the need to widen and deepen the Port of Houston. All of this offtake 
of crude and, and, and liquid products and, and the petrochemicals being derived from it are kind of running head on into other needs of the port, container traffic and what have you. The only solution to that congestion issue on the port is to widen and deepen, which takes authorization of the federal government, which is a huge, huge thing. It's very hard to get it. Uh, we'll be spending a lot of time in Washington and encouraging many of you to participate in our trip to Washington and trips to Washington uh, to make this case in Washington that we need to widen and deepen the Port of Houston. The key to that is going to be that we're going to bring most of the capital for that project from Houston. We're not going to Washington for money. We're going for authorization. Uh, the Port of Houston is a federal waterway. We can't touch it. We can't turn a spade uh, of dirt in that channel uh, without the federal government. So anyway, think about that because it relates directly to what Helen is saying. We, we have to avoid kind of uh, congestion points right now that keep this thing from continuing to happen. Helen, thank you so much for the, for the discussion. Patrick, as always, thanks, great job. This is my moment for a quick advertisement. Um, it's already time to think about the annual meeting of the partnership. We have set the date for the annual meeting. It'll be January 22nd. Uh, Bobby Tudor, chair of Tudor Pickering and Holt, will be the incoming chair of the partnership. And, and Scott McClellan will talk about the year that we've just had. I'll talk a little bit about our broad strategy. And, and then Bobby will pick up a, a couple of issues that he would like to emphasize in his year as chair. We'll have the state of Houston's petrochemical industry out on March 3rd our second such state of Houston's Petrochem, which gets bills right on what Helen was talking about. The fact that we're a net exporter of crude and gas means we're the low cost feedstock source globally for the things that drive the Petrochem industry. So it's very exciting. So March 3rd. And then our Women's Business Alliance will host its ninth annual Rise to the Top event on March 6th. If you haven't been to Rise to the Top, I'm speaking mainly to the women in the room. They let about 10 guys in a year. No, they let a few more in. But it's really a discussion targeted at, I would call, mid-management women, kind of mid-career women, and helping them identify and overcome the obstacles that I think are somewhat unique to women in, still in today's workforce. So a very popular event. All three of the events that I've just mentioned will be at the Hilton Americas, Hilton Americas downtown. So on your way out, you'll be, be provided copies of the highlights and the Houston employment forecast, so don't forget to grab those. I encourage you uh, to look at our website at any time. A month at a glance is out there. We provide a, just a steady stream of the latest uh, economic data picking up on a lot of the topics today. If I don't see you again this year, have a great holiday. I'm already thinking about the end of the year, as you can tell. Uh, really appreciate you all being here. Thank you. <laughs>